All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, it's 12.02, and so we wanna go ahead and, and get started with uh, today's webinar. Um, and, and Stephen McBride, who's one of the MAP team members, will continue to um, admit people. So um, Dr. Page won't get, won't get too far, and they should be able to catch up. So again, welcome to everyone who's here with me today, with, here with us today, excuse me. Uh, my name is uh, LaVon Esters, and I'm the co-director of the Mentoring at Purdue program. I see some familiar names with us today, so welcome back. And those who are new, uh, thank you for joining us today. So I'm, I'm very excited about today's webinar. Uh, this, for those of you who do not know, this is our arguably one of our gym activities uh, programs that we put on every year. And this year, as you can see on my screen, is the ninth annual Invited Lecture Series. Um, and uh, we're going to, we're joined today by Dr. Stephanie Page, and I will in a minute read a, a bio about her. She has a very fascinating background. Uh, I know her well. She's fellow Aggie from North Carolina a t State University, so I'm also glad to have an Aggie with us today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to mention. Uh, we have Dr. Page's main uh, lecture that she will give in a few moments. Uh, and that will go from 12 to 1 Eastern time. And then from 1 to 1.30, uh, Dr. Page is going to engage in the conversation that will be facilitated by Dr. Neil Knobloch, who's also co-director for the Mentoring and Purdue program from 1 o'clock to 1.30. So if you're a graduate student or a postdoc, please uh, stay on for that last 30 minutes. And Dr. Knobloch is going to uh, facilitate that again. So I'm looking forward to that session. So uh, what I want to do now is read a little bit about Dr. Page so you all familiar with just exactly who Dr. Page is. And, and again, um, some of you may know her, but uh, in case you do, this would be a, a general reminder of her background. So Dr. Page is, uh, is a STEM equity and community engagement professional who has over 15 years of biological and biomedical academic research experience. She earned her doctorate in biochemistry and biophysics from the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Page is a proud graduate of North Carolina a State University with a bachelor's and master's in chemical engineering and biology, respectively. In 2014, Dr. Page earned the highest honor awarded to a graduate student in her PhD department, Diane Harris Leadership Award for Exemplary Research, Education, and Public Service. She has been recognized as a researcher by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the Biophysical Society, and the American Heart Association. Throughout her career as a scientist, Dr. Page is committed, has been committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Academy in STEM. She is the creator of the Black and STEM, hashtag Black and STEM community, so please follow that on Twitter, which is a social media following of nearly 17,000 individuals and organizations. Over the years, she has contributed to several major efforts to improve the scientific workforce and education through National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's NASM report on mentoring in STEM. The additional M stands for medicine. In her current role, she leads communications and community engagement for the Advanced Resource and Coordination or ARCA Network and NSF Advanced Funded STEM Equity Brain Trust. So without further ado, I'm pleased, very pleased to share with you and turn it over to Dr. Stephanie Page, our ninth annual invited lecture series speaker. Dr. Page, over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Esters. Um, it truly is a pleasure to be here with you all today and to have this conversation and engage with you. I will jump right in in consideration of time. And I know that Dr. Esters gave you all a little bit about my background, but I kind of wanted to anchor our discussion today on mentoring and on equity frameworks by telling a little bit about my story. So my path, again, um, as Dr. Esters mentioned, started with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering at North Carolina a and I went on to earn my master's in biology and then my PhD in biochemistry and biophysics at the University of North Carolina. And when I talk a little bit about mentoring, it's important for me to also show you that along the way, there were people in my life who served as men mentors and I'm very thankful to be able to make the statement that for the most part, my advisors were also mentors. 
I am fortunate to have many mentors along the way also. And so what I'm sh showing here, um, and actually Dr. Esther's, it looks like I'm having a bit of an issue. Can everyone see my screen? No, not yet. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing and start sharing again, if that's okay. Are we there now? <laughs> yeah, once you start the screen share, yep. Perfect, thank you. thank you. So apologies for that, but this is essentially the this only slide you've missed, it's so great. Um, but I wanted to just show again that I'm very thankful to be able to say that my advisors along my path were also my mentors. And I'm very appreciative to also be able to share that there were uh, additional mentors that I was able to gain along the way. So just to highlight, particularly because they are Black women scientists, um, some of these names that I've added in addition to my advisors, Dr. Margaret Knipes, who was my biochemistry professor, um, which was a course I took at the very end of my undergraduate career and clearly was instrumental in where I ended up landing and ended up earning a PhD in biochemistry. Um, Dr. Catherine White, who was instrumental during my time in my master's program because it was not her responsibility, but she very much showed me and guided me through becoming an independent scientist, an independent problem solver that was very much enhancing toward my eventually transitioning into a very competitive, very demanding PhD program at UNC. And then I also wanna highlight Dr. Baronda Montgomery, who was the first black woman and biochemist who I had met outside of an HBCU. She is a full professor at Michigan State University. And she was actually introduced to me by another mentor of mine, Ashala Freeman. And you'll hear Dr. Montgomery's name a little bit more throughout this talk because she and I were able to work together on our commission paper on the National Academy's report on mentoring. I know that I stipulated that I was fortunate to be able to call most of my advisors a mentor. So I wanna just kind of anchor us a little bit. In, our, in these discussions, we tend to use mentor interchangeably. And that's really important for me to highlight to you all. And it actually sounds like I'm having one more tech issue. I'm going to switch over my audio, if that's okay, Dr. Esters. Yes, by all means. Okay. Okay, great, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So in sharing with you how I think of mentor and advisor in these different terms, I think it's important to kind of give us a little bit to anchor this conversation. Where typically when we think of advisors, we think of those relationships being rooted in academic roles and designated outcomes. You tend to be in a position such as an undergraduate student or a graduate student, and even sometimes an early career faculty member where you have an advisor as a part of a structure in a program. And there is within that relationship, a design to reach certain outcomes. There also tends to be a term limit to the relationship of an advisor. Even though we know that in, in academic paths, advisors can continue to provide resources such as letters of recommendation. We don't necessarily think of this as an ongoing and deepening relationship. It typically is dictated by a specific term. And then there's this idea that trust is implied. And this is also kind of something that, uh, that we tend to overlook, particularly in conversations and contexts around equity, where someone seems to be assumed to be trustful or trustworthy because they obtain a certain position. And because they obtain that position, a lot of times the environment assigns trust to them. Additionally, with advisors, typically the relationship quality is not necessarily a priority. 
when we think of mentoring, and we think of the title of mentor, the relationship tends to be more rooted in an investment in an individual beyond just a curriculum or program. There's more of an investment in who you are as a person and what your needs are. There tends to be an ongoing relationship that's not just defined, for example, by the end of a degree program or whether or not you're at the same institution. Additionally, trust is built. This is believed to be um, a clear difference with the term or title of advisor because the expectation is that the mentee and the mentor are exchanging with each other and engaging with each other and building trust between each other where one person is not empowered with the assumption of trust. And finally, but definitely not the least of it all, the relationship quality is a priority. How are needs being met? Are both people feeling respected and valued in the relationship? It's important for me to break this down early on because I know that oftentimes we mix, we intermix the term mentor and advisor. And that's also some of, some of that intermixing does happen or interchanging happens in this talk today. But I also kind of want us to be thinking about this, particularly as I introduce themes around um, frameworks of equity. I have a couple of personal rules of mentoring that I would also like to share with you because I think it's important to sort of have these conversations in a really truthful way. Um, I believe that mentoring is not automatically a part of advising of relationships. And I do think that I've hinted at that a little bit already, that advisors are not automatically mentors, that there is a lot more to do in order to earn the title of a mentor. And that mentoring is work for both mentors and mentees. There's both consi there's considerations on both sides. We also know through both anecdotal data and just looking more critically and deeply at mentoring that it is invaluable and that it is critical for success in so many different paths. Mentoring, I absolutely must say, is not what will fix inequity and injustice. It is a partial solution in response to inequity, but ultimately what we really need is sustained systemic change. So when we are having conversations about mentoring and about effective mentoring, it's really important to highlight that this is not the bandage that is going to fix the structural inequity and injustice that we experience and that is tied to and inextricably linked to our current paths and, and environments and spaces, um, particularly in higher education. I wanted to take a quick moment to sort of describe these equity frameworks that I've mentioned a couple of times. And it's really great for me to be able to do that in the context of my current work. Just to give you a little bit of background on the ARC network, we exist to build on the NSF advanced program efforts focused on intersectional gender equity. The ARC network aims to connect widely dispersed scholars and practitioners committed to STEM equity in an engaged stakeholder community. And we work to empower that community to collectively drive systemic change. Our home organization is the Women in Engineering Proactive Network, or WePAN. And we are really excited to be a part of the WePAN umbrella and to be able to do the work that we do with WePAN. So to the frameworks. I'm starting here with intentionality because we apply three core frameworks. And so I wanted to introduce them to you one by one. And with intentionality, we are saying that we are cultivating individual and organizational self-awareness and action. We are saying that we are purposeful and deliber deliberate in aligning our strategies and behaviors with our values, and that we take that same purpose and approach to our communities. And when you're using it intentionality as a framework, you really are thinking about modeling who you say you are and who you say you want to be. And it's both personal accountability as, as much as it is accountability within members of your community and within holding true to the approaches that you choose to take and ensuring that those values are, are integrated moving forward. 
Intersectionality is a term that we've heard many, many times, but it's often misrepresented as just a category of identity, when really it is a framework and a lens through which we examine how systems of oppression intertwine to influence experiences and opportunities. I want to shift very quickly to a slide that I borrowed from the ARC Network PI, Dr. Heather Metcalf, in order to look a little bit more deeply at intersectionality. Here, Heather is showing a little bit of the um, history of the term, which was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, and that some of these connections extend all the way back to Sojourner's Truth, Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech in 1851. And if you look at just what is shown here in this model that was developed by Morgan et al., we are seeing that there's an axis of domination and that above the axis is privilege and below is oppression. And there are so many different overlapping identities that an individual can have that places them in different positions in context of power and dominance within society and within many of our microcosms in society. The last of our three frameworks that we apply in our work is also inclusivity. This is where we take into account those who have been historically marginalized and excluded. And we want to ensure that we are looking beyond equality. We are looking beyond everybody getting the same thing and looking at equity where we're talking about everyone getting their needs met, even those needs that are maybe unique or different. And so that means being invested, that means being intentional, that means take, applying an intersectional lens so that we can better meet those needs and support our community doing their work in many different spheres as they are, doing, as they are meeting several different needs. So now that I've gone over the three core um, equity frameworks that we apply, I really want us to keep this in mind as we think about mentoring and we think about the mentoring models that I'm going to introduce to you today. Oh, but I did forget that I love to include this slide because it really represents how I do my work as a community engagement manager and how I apply those lenses, where we have so many different stakeholders group, groups in the communities and we facilitate um, their drive, their work toward systemic equity in many different ways. But we want to really, again, both integrate in our approaches and strategies and help them integrate in their own approaches and strategies, these three equity frameworks. And just in case you want to know a little bit more in the essence of time or in consideration of time, I have added a few more slides um, in case questions come up later on in, in our time today. I wanted to kind of take a moment to anchor us in sort of this idea of, you know, what do we think about when we think of inequity? And this is really important for me when I discuss mentoring and the various mentoring models that I'll show you today to kind of really keep in mind that we are not in spaces where people are experiencing equitable paths and equitable environments. And so I wanted to just highlight a couple of examples where inequity arises in ways that we can see it and measure it more globally. In the context of the diversity innovation paradox, we see that minoritized graduate students are likely to have their novel contrib contributions discounted and they are less likely than their majority counterparts to obtain academic positions. And this happens despite the fact that these individuals are innovating at higher rates. When we look at reports um, led by Ginther, for example, we see these racial and ethnic disparities and who is earning funding or gaining funding from the NIH. The Society for Women Engineers has demonstrated through multiple communications that there are intersectional gender disparities in faculty advancement, meaning, for example, that Black women are not advancing in the faculty path and moving into more leadership roles. 
We also see more globally an actual lack of studies and analyses that include and account for disabled and LGBTQ plus individuals. And that lack of consideration often means that policies that are derived from or that are inspired by findings in different studies are missing a valuable um, perspective. And again, lacking in terms of building in the intentional, intersectional and inclusive frameworks. When we think of inequity then on more of an individual basis, there are some common experiences that individuals have. And when we look at this, um, I guess what I consider to be a very small uh, sampling of some of those common individual experiences, I think that we can see a lot of different needs that might arise in the context of mentoring relationships. And I do want to sort of say and, and point out that it that for me it's really important to highlight this because as we're talking about mentoring, we want to keep in mind that experiencing any one of these can lead to distress, but to encounter them simultaneously on a regular basis over extended periods of time with little to no empath support and on top of the baseline features, meaning some of the more universally experienced toxicity of these environments, that this can induce a lot of distress. And individuals are often left to find and build relationships that fulfill critical unmet needs in order to thrive and advance and to counter these negative experiences. I wanted to highlight briefly the National Academy's report on the science of effective mentorship in STEM because this, again, this really is what brought my, um, myself and Dr. Montgomery together. And it really presented for me an opportunity to think deeply about mentoring and to apply these frameworks as we were doing our examinations of mentoring models. Dr. Montgomery and myself were charged with looking at non-dyadic mentoring models and what coalesced for Dr. Montgomery and myself was not only an examination of these models, but an examination of hierarchies and power systems that impact how and where mentoring occurs. Um, if Stephen could, I shared a link with him so that you all could find the report and also find other resources such as the podcast that, um, that the National Academies is now doing and also um, our commission papers for this report. I said a word in the, as I was describing the previous slide that I wanna take a moment to define and that word is dyadic. Dyadic mentoring means paired mentoring. So we tend to think of like one to one, one mentor for one mentee. These are often hierarchical and flow of information where typically information is going from the mentor to the mentee. And this is typically what we think of when we consider mentoring in academic settings. Um, there are times where you see what we call a, a mutual or a bilateral flow of information where there's more of an engagement in both directions by the mentor and mentee. So thus, when I say non-dyadic mentoring, which is what Dr. Montgomery and myself were charged with examining um, and doing the literature review and study of, um, that essentially means non-paired mentoring. And there are a couple of other models of this non-paired mentoring that we do see in, typically see in academic settings. So here we see where one mentee has multiple mentors. And this is associated actually in, with improved outcomes and supporting success in STEM as compared to just that traditional dyadic models. What may come into mind when you see this is maybe being in an academic setting and building relationship, mentoring relationships with multiple faculty in your department, for example, and then maintaining those relationships over time. This might also look for some like a, a dissertation committee, for example, or building relationships with faculty and saying, you know, I would like these people to serve on my com committee, do you mind serving? Or maybe you already have a committee established and you just begin to build these multiple, these, excuse me, mentoring relationship with those members. 
Another one that we tend to see in academic settings is the mentoring triad, where you have um, typically a post-grad mentor or in the context of graduate students, you might have a more advanced individual who's mentoring that's kind of sitting at the center of the triad. So maybe there's a postdoc that is advising graduate students, or maybe there is a more advanced graduate student advising you know, graduate students earlier in their process. But really a great way to explain this or, or demonstrate this is where there's an undergraduate, stu undergraduate student who maybe is working in a lab or in a group and that there is a post-grad mentor and that the, the senior mentor or, men or PI is kind of instructing the postdoc or the more advanced graduate student as that person directly advises um, the undergrad. And this we call an open triad. A closed triad is where you typically see more direct mentoring between the senior mentor or PI and often the undergrad, the mentee, and in addition to sort of that postgrad mentor um, mentoring the mentee. And this is starred here because it's believed that greater growth in terms of critical thinking and, and science identity happens in the closed triad. So before I introduce a few more models, I wanted to take a step back and kind of reorient us to those equity frameworks. And I like to do this because it allows us to sort of take a pause and think about what kind of questions could we ask if we're someone examining these mentoring models in different settings and we're trying to make an assessment of how effective these mentoring models are, if we're designing approaches to developing mentoring programs, what are the types of questions that we could ask where we're applying those equity frameworks? You know, one example that I have here is what makes the mentoring relationship successful? So is it both meeting the, you know, whatever um, outcomes are necessary? So for example, if you're a graduate student, you need to pass your quals, you need to write papers, you need to go to meetings, you, know, you need to complete your dissertation work and write a dissertation. But is there, are there other things in addition to that? And then in the context of different relationship, mentoring relationships, are those curriculum or those success benchmarks for completing the degree program, are they even really relevant? Other questions we can ask are, does every mentee have the same needs? Um, how do we evaluate the effectiveness of meeting various sets of needs? And then, you know, my challenge to you is to think of like what other questions come to mind for you in terms of evaluating this through those equity frameworks. So let's look at a few more models that we tend to see applied in both formal and informal settings and situations. First here I have the collective or group group-based mentoring, where there tends to be multiple mentors working together to mentor a group of mentees. We tend to see peer-to-peer -peer mentoring between the mentees in this model, and this tends to be associated with either resulting in or resulting from the production of microclimates. And with microclimates, I'm meaning identity or affinity-based groups. And this can also be accomplished either in person and online. And we tend to see this type of mentoring arise in social media based groups, which we'll discuss a little bit in um, one of the case studies. I borrowed this particular figure from one of Dr. Montgomery's publications where she was discussing mentoring. And in this network mentoring model, what she is demonstrating is that a mentor, a mentee, excuse me, can develop a constellation, if you will, of mentoring relationships that's built to fulfill various needs. These networks may or may not connect, but this represents a place where I like to briefly again visit those equity frameworks. Typically building this constellation relies on the mentee having access to networks through their mentor or through their institution. We tend to see inequity when it comes to access to networks and experiences in networks. 
And many times we see marginalized mentees building these constellations, not with the support of their mentor or mentor's institution, but in fact, because of a lack of support for meeting critical benchmarks for success. And this is another one of those places where mentor and advisor kind of get intermixed in discussion around these, but the paradigm is to use the word mentor. And so typically what I like to do is just to try to kind of stipulate that inequity could be arising because advisors, departments are not equitably exposing mentees, graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs to networks such that those individuals can pursue these constellations in kind of a supported way. Again, oftentimes people are left to pursue these constellations through their own kind of working and networking. The final model I want to show to you today is the nested mentoring model. And we can also, we also sometimes call this a hybrid mentoring model where you know, hopefully you can see where there are overlap of some of the different models. So you can kind of see some of the collective group models, um, collective and group mentoring models here. And you can sort of see hopefully in an envision where, you know, this is kind of reflecting to maybe some networking, maybe mentors have relationships with each other because there's overlap of network. And this is also um, really great to demonstrate because it's, it's less no, you know, it's less studied and analyzed as a model, but it is what we tend to see in models that are really meeting critical needs of marginalized mentees. It's considered beneficial to the mentees for many reasons, including that the mentors having more of their needs met, in fact, is associated with improving the quality of the mentoring that is experienced by the mentee. The mentor senses the support of other mentors in meeting the needs of the mentees also. So it's not, so within this model and this sort of mentoring relationship set, it's not on one or two mentors to really maintain and meet the, maintain meeting the needs of the mentees. The mutual relationship also empowers the mentee in that they are recognized as a valuable contributor. And so that's represented by some of these bi-directional arrows. There also tends to be more accountability. Even though it might not happen sort of formally, structurally, we tend to see more of kind of like a code of conduct or a code of operation amongst these types of models. I found that because of mutual networks, some of my mentoring relationships looked more like these nested models. So as I mentioned, Dr. Shala Freeman initially introduced me to Dr. Um, Dr. Montgomery and that I had advisors at a &T who knew advisors that became mentors or who knew people who I connected with who became mentors. And reflective of the need to apply equity frameworks to approach um, and examine mentoring models, Dr. Montgomery and I also included some additional considerations beyond just these specific models. So I just wanna highlight briefly two main considerations, the first being culturally relevant mentoring where we highlighted by Crutcher that mentors must maintain a dual perspective, seeing the mentee as an individual, as well as a part of a larger social context. And so there's both the consideration of the individual and what they need, but also where are they in the space of the world around them in the space of the departmental environment, in the space of the classroom or the lab. And then Waston Saradin highlighted that mentoring researchers and practitioners to better understand the problems facing marginalized and minoritized mentees are rooted in pervasive systemic and institutional equity. And it offers these mentors opportunities to align those understandings with key components of mentoring processes. Another consideration is context-based mentoring, which I somewhat highlighted, but I want to bring out more deeply. And this takes into consideration environmental context representation or lack thereof. And so some of those feelings that I highlighted in that large inequity slide around feeling invisible or feeling isolated. And it uses this information to inform the mentoring practice itself. 
So picking back up on that slide around inequity, I wanted to kind of bring this back to your attention because I want to revisit some of these common experiences as a result of existing in equitable spaces, in inequitable spaces, to prime our minds as we look at the core needs of mentees and mentors. And I want us to think about this in the context of how those needs can be intensified as a result of the impacts of inequity. So what I've highlighted here are just some of the core needs of mentees. And so thinking from the perspective of the mentee, what are some of the things that we know need to be considered regardless of the nature of the mentoring model or the mentoring relationship? So these five are really what Dr. Montgomery and I arrived at in terms of just what should be an undergirding foundational part of any mentoring relationship or mentoring program or mentoring setup. There's personalization that integrates identity and the idea of mentoring the whole person. There's guidance, which indicates being engaged in the process of how to best na navigate um, the mentee's desired path. There is, in fact, which can be uncomfortable, correction, which is just kind of helping the mentee see where there are opportunities for improvement and growth. Also, what tends to be really important for marginalized and minoritized mentees is affirmation. And this is the recognition of strengths and abilities. It's taking time to highlight successes and celebrate successes and showing the mentee that they belong in their chosen path. Chosen path. And then lastly is agency, where there's really a recognition to the mentee that the mentee themselves is responsible for helming their ship and sort of kind of encouraging ownership of the process or the path that the mentee is in. And here's just sort of how I demonstrate that and to just reiterate that there are, most mentees will need multiple mentoring relationships in order to meet all of their needs. But when it comes to these core needs, these should be a consideration for each and every one of those mentoring relationships. I think that often what gets left out in these conversations is that mentors have needs also. And we tend to kind of look at things from the perspective of the mentee, which is really important. But we also have to consider that mentors can also be minoritized and marginalized in their setting. But even in the broader context, that again, if we're thinking of this about as a relationship, that we also want to think about needs of all parties involved. And so for those serving in the roles of mentors, what Dr. Montgomery and I arrived at in terms of core needs is first the space to grow. So the opportunity to grow as a mentor and to grow as a supporter of someone else's success in, in their path, desired path. There's also a need for openness. The mentor needs the necessary information in order to guide the mentee and in order to build relationship with the mentee and to build trust. The mentor needs active participation. The mentee should be engaged in, in participative and, and active and, and really kind of upholding their end of maintaining this relationship. The mentor needs to um, needs value and needs to be understood as a, as a valued person. And this is in part understanding the expertise and the time and the energy that the mentor is contributing to the mentoring relationship. And similar to the mentee, the, the mentor needs correction. And that is, you know, both the ability to be open to that, to receiving evaluation and open to give evaluation on the part of the mentee. So it's the mentee's ability to communicate to the mentor where the mentee sees opportunity for growth within the mentoring relationship. And again, I just wanted to highlight um, a visual representation of this relationship and these core needs being sort of transmitted or executed within the relationship. And when you think particularly in the context that most mentors have multiple me uh, mentees, this really brings into, um, I guess, into our perception, like how important it is to consider the needs of, the, of mentors. 
I think it's also critical to highlight that there are these two core shared needs and there seems to be a lot of consensus around these needs. And there also tends to be a, a need to establish and revisit within the mentoring relationship these needs and sort of asking ourselves as we are in our mentoring relationships, what are our expectations of each other and of this relationship? And then saying, you know, are we continuously building trust? Are we, are we allowing each other to engage and to grow in this relationship? So I'm close to the end of my talk, but I really wanted to highlight what I think is an amazing case study of some of what I've discussed with you today. And one of these amazing examples is Vanguard STEM. Vanguard STEM is an online community and platform founded in 2015 by astrophysicist Dr. Jedida Eisler. And Vanguard STEM centers women, girls, and non-binary people of color in STEM fields. They incorporate both lived experiences in addition to expertise in areas including critical race theory, science and technology studies, cultural studies, and social psychology to meet the critical needs of the population they want to reach and serve. They actually also hosted Dr. Montgomery to discuss non-oppressive mentoring on their show. And if Stephen, if you could please share the link to that episode in the chat. But one thing that I wanted to highlight with Vanguard STEM and why I thought that they represent an amazing um, example of some of these models, particularly in the context of formal, um, excuse me, of mentoring outside of the formal academic setting, is that in their recent publication in genealogy that just came out, they discussed their structure and approach to their work, including their mentoring programming. They applied equity frameworks to bring mentoring to, mentoring to various settings to meet various needs. And we can see a few of the mentoring models represented in this figure from their paper. Where here we see a mutual dyadic model where you have you know, a paired setting where both parties are exchanging information, so both the mentor and the mentee. And panel B, we see an example of nested mentoring, where actually here you have people serving as mentor in the mentor role and people also serving in the mentee role. And there is a, a collective exchange in different directions amongst them all. And then with panel C, um, this is more collective mentoring where you have a mentor who's kind of anchoring the mentoring session, but you're also seeing peer mentoring between the mentees in the group. I would also be remiss if I did not um, mention the community that I started that Dr. Esther's mentioned in my bio because it represents a way in which nested and coll collective mentoring can arise as a result of community coalescing around identity. So through our community chats, community calls, um, excuse me, Twitter chats, community calls, and even through sometimes unfacilitated engagement, mentoring rose as a key feature of the community. So as people became, became more engaged and we saw, we found each other where we were, both in our career paths and in different disciplines, we found that we could offer a lot to each other. There were people who were in more administrative roles, who were faculty, um, there were people who were graduate students and undergraduate students and even people who were engaging who were K through 12 educators and or students. And so what we found kind of naturally occurred was that these collective mentoring relationships were built with such that you had mentors supporting mentors, you had peer mentoring amongst mentees or people who were more early career or just starting their educational, um, their higher educational path. And, but then you all, so you saw it all kind of working together collectively. So I am actually, really excited for your questions and to continue to engage and not just listen to my own voice and not just show off how much I love the color purple. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for listening me to me to this point. Um, and yes, Dr. Esters, are you ready for questions? Yes, thank you. So, um, well, you know, let me just say, Dr. Page, you, this is phenomenal. 
talk that you gave us today. And, and I really am appreciative of your time and efforts today. So having said that, um, are there any chats? Yes, and purple is the best color as someone <laughs> in the chat, Dr. Page. So yeah, for those who don't know, Dr. Page loves her some purple. So, <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Please put them in the chat. Or Stephen, I guess it's okay if folks can unmute themselves. Is that okay, Stephen? Absolutely. Yeah, so if you have a question, unmute. If not, I did write down two questions I have. And um, so anyone have a question? You, oh, all right, here's a question, Dr. Page. Uh, do you have a course or training that you recommend for people interested in guided learning or mentoring? I I actually think that the resources that are available through the National Academy site, um, which Stephen dropped in the chat, and we'll, we will drop those and, and um, Dr. Esters and Stephen has those. There are so many different resources. The report is a great place to start because not only does it include, it, it is a consensus report. And so these are so many people coming together to to put together kind of like the best practices. But then I will also say that the podcast is phenomenal. There are other resources available through the site. And then additionally, for particularly for people who are interested in seeing more of the literature, um, I would definitely encourage you to look at all of the commissioned reports in addition to the consensus report that was released. I, I truly believe that's the best place to start. And I also encourage you, um, and if Stephen could drop that in the chat, the link to um, the Vanguard STEM paper in genealogy that just came out. Um, they include some really phenomenal resources there, and they also describe how they go about their mentoring programming. And yeah, that's an excellent paper, by the way. I'm not just saying that because I did read it, Dr. Page. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Feel free, again, to pose other questions in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, Dr. Knobloch, I know you always have good questions. You need, anything come to mind, Dr. Knobloch, as you heard Dr. Page's uh, talk today that you want to ask? Well, thank you, Dr. Page. Um, it was fun uh, listening and watching the chat at the same time. A lot of people were shouting out how insightful it was. I would like to go a little bit more personal and, um, and just have you share um, what would be one of the moments that you kind of go back to in um, in your different relationships um, th with working with mentors and, and other impactful pe people? And what does that look like that really seems to be, you know, that aha, this is where I was able to connect to mentoring and understand how important it is? Wow, that that is actually a phenomenal question because it's, I, I thought about it so much today, like what would be my example if I were asked? Um, and, you know, uh, there are two that, that truly come to mind. Um, and, you know, to be very, very personal, um, I'll, I'll share two. One is that, you know, I became a mom during my master's program at a and and I was, um, I remember sort of having it stuck in my mind that I'm, you know, here I'm getting a research-based master's. I have to be in the lab. There are so many things that I need to be able to accomplish. I'm going to go to my advisor, who's uh, Dr. Doritha Fouché, and I, and she's going to tell me I can't work in the lab anymore. <laughs> She's, you know, just all of these things are going to disintegrate when I come to her and say, you know, I, I'm about to have a child. And I went to, to Dr. Fouché and, and, you know, I was, I was also really worried, which I didn't articulate, articulate to her about the fact that I wanted to go on to get a PhD. Um, what would she say to that? So I remembered um, going and having the, the conversation with Dr. Fouché and without my even mentioning the PhD, she, she stopped me and she said, you can still do this. You're going to still do this. We're going to, you're, it's going to take hard work. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to get you there. And then um, the next thing that happened was, you know, maybe a couple of months down the line when it was time for me to get back in lab, um, I came back to work 
And Dr. Fouché had bought um, different lab coats, expanding lab coats in size, so that as my belly grew, my, you know, I had my PPE in my PPE fit. And, you know, I say all of that um, because this was not, this didn't necessarily have to be contextualized um, in this way that was just really considerate of what I needed and what I wanted to do. And I think that it is fair to say that, you know, the considerations that Dr. Fouché were making were not just as my advisor, not just as how do, how does she get me out of the, the graduate program? It was, how does she ensure that I feel and I know I can do this, that I can get through? And Dr. Fouché, I mean, literally, um, I was, <laughs> I started applying for PhD programs when my son was only two months old. And Dr. Fouché was really instrumental in, in just kind of keeping me encouraged and keeping me focused on what my goal was. She gave me a lot of advice as a parent. She shared personal things about her life and her personal story with me, not just as a way to motivate me, but to kind of give me something to anchor to, to kind of understand what it would take to parent and PhD at the same time. Um, Dr. Fouché would always show up. There were times when if I got missing, so if I wasn't responsive for six months, she would just drop by. There were times where my phone rang and I'd be in lab and she'd say, I'm downstairs. Or there are times where she would say, you know, pick a Wednesday, I'm going to cook dinner, you know, come to the house, you know, just offering me so much more than what she had to, even after, again, her job as my advisor was done. The other really personal context, which I think you can kind of glean, is that my dissertation advisor um, became my advisor when I had a one-year-old. I started graduate, graduate school my, when my son was one. My, I started my PhD program, I'll say, I'll differentiate, when my son was one. And there were so many things that happened throughout graduate school because, I mean, between toddlering um, and then on top of that, I wanted to be in the biophysics program, which is kind of an additional intensive concentration to complete. Um, Bob was always really encouraging. And then as I got close, uh, about halfway, we thought I was at the end. I ended up being more halfway than I was at the end. It was one of those things where, you know, you're get, you have papers you need to submit, the story's not quite done. Then I made a discovery. And then he was like, you need to pursue this. We, we need to see where this takes us. And as that was happening, my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And my father actually passed away as I was finishing my doctoral program. And I remember we would have these discussions, you know, kind of like the, the, the advisee advisor meetings, you know, this is where we are on the calendar. This, these are the things we need to do. But there were just two things that were remarkable for me that Bob did and, and Ruth did, who was also a, an advisor. She was not a formal advisor, but she was a faculty in my lab. And that was kind of at the end of each meeting, stopping and saying, okay, but now what do you need? And now let's look at where you need to be. There were a lot of hard decisions. When should I go visit my father? When should I, you know, when should I take time off? How am I really doing with all of this? And, you know, that I could see things kind of happening in you know, other people's lives where their advisors, they were advising them, but they weren't necessarily mentoring them. So it was amazing for me to be able to have those experiences. Um, you know, Bob was really great. He encouraged me to do things that graduate students don't typically do. Um, you know, he put me out there at conferences to give talks and that was not his job as, as, my, as my advisor. You know, he really went above and beyond. And so that's, you know, those are some very personal stories about where I can call Dr. Fouché and, and Bob <laughs> mentors um, for me personally. Thank you, Dr. Pate. We have one more question. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, well, so we have a, two questions, but uh, hopefully Anna Kay will stay on for the next sessions because uh, I need, I want to do it in order, Anna Kay. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Page the question. 
here, which is, uh, do you feel that age, age difference between mentor and mentee can affect a mentoring relationship? That's a good one. Um, because, and, and I say it's a good one because, you know, when we consider, when we look at things through an intersectional lens, I feel like age oftentimes gets overlooked and, and there are a lot of dynamics around age, interestingly. And so when I say that, I mean that, you know, in some spaces, um, depending on other aspects of your identity, age can be valued. Um, whereas, you know, it can be undervalued in some aspects of identity. Um, but then there's also kind of this assignment of age with, with wisdom. And I think that if you allow age to really inform the quality of the relationship, you could potentially lose. And I say that because if we think back to just that mutual dyadic mentoring model. So you have one-to-one mentor to mentee. If the mentee does not feel like they're a valuable contributor in that relationship, and they feel that way possibly because of age, then you won't see as much engagement and as much consideration either for the needs of the mentor. I think that if we also look at it from the perspective of the mentor where they assign themselves a certain value or devalue the mentee because of age or along that axis, that they won't be as receptive, not just to the needs of the mentee, but also to um, the mentee being able to contribute to the life and the relationship of the mentor. So I think there are a lot of different ways that we can kind of block ourselves based on different assumptions that we make. And, you know, I think too, um, it's, this is a good place to sort of highlight kind of who has implied trust in that relationship as opposed to both people building trust. So that's another great thing to think about, but um, I'm looking at what time it is. <laughs> that's good. No, I appreciate that, Dr. Page. So, so let me uh, stop here and just say a few things, Dr. Page. Number one, um, thank you, thank you, thank you a thousand times over for a phenomenal uh, talk today for our ninth annual Invital Lecture Series. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, uh, again, everyone, uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to transition to a chat uh, for graduate students. It's open to graduate students and postdocs. So if you're a graduate student or a postdoc, please stay on. Everyone else, uh, you're free to leave in a few moments. Uh, Dr. Knobloch, who's the co-director of the MAP program, will facilitate that session. I'm going to have to log off myself, but I will join. But Dr. Knobloch will facilitate that. I also want to make sure that uh, I say thank you to everyone who sh who was here today with us on this call, attended this uh, webinar. I really appreciate your support and look forward to you all spreading the word about it. Again, this will be posted. A link to the, today's talk will be, and the chat will be posted to Twitter, Facebook. Uh, it'll be on our website, our YouTube channel. So please be on the lookout for that. Uh, I also want to say, as I always do, thank you to the great mentoring, uh, our MAP team. I couldn't do this without help and support of our MAP team, Stephen, again, Dr. Nalbach, Stephen, Victoria, Andres, um, Cornell, uh, am I missing anyone? Ryan Cornegate, thank you. Thank you, Ryan is always our tweeter, uh, if you would. <laughs> so again, uh, if, if you're a faculty member or staff, uh, we just ask that you can log, you can log off now, but if you're a graduate student or postdoc, please stay on. And from this point forward, I will turn over to Dr. Knobloch um, to lead and to facilitate the session um, as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Page, so much for your work today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.